Anyone can slap a logo on a work shirt, but why wear something that looks and feels generic and mass-produced? With the Land's End Business, you can get fully customized clothing, accessories, and promotional products featuring your logo and colors, all expertly made by the Land's End team. And with best-in-class customer care, Land's End will handle the inventory while you run your business. Since 1993, thousands of businesses have relied on Land's End Business to outfit their employees, from major financial institutions to local mom and pops. They offer timeless style that fits every body type with the widest range of sizes you'll find in branded apparel. You'll know the difference once you see it with premium fabric and designs that will have your uniforms looking fresh and functional. See why thousands of companies count on Land's End Business. Go to business.landsend.com le2023 and use promo code le2023 for 20% off your order. That's business.landsend.com le2023. Promo code le2023 for 20% off your order. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Today, we're going to help you see the world for less money and to better splurge so that you create awesome memories with the man behind the We Travel There podcast, Lee Huffman. In our headlines, Social Security recipients are scoring a raise next year. How does it look and how do you manage money when your budget is fixed? We'll share tips on both fronts. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Stacker Patrick, who wants to know if he should start new 529 accounts for each of his kids or add them as beneficiaries on his account. And then I'll share some iconic trivia. And now, two guys who look almost as good as I do in jeans, it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-
hosts running around and we're not sure which one's the real one. New superpowers evolving. Yes. Let's change the metaverse into the singular verse. And while we do that, uh, we've got something great for you guys to listen to. Hold on. U.S. Cellular is introducing us mode. It's like airplane mode, but for people. It's a way to set up your phone so it doesn't get in the way of people really being with each other. Block distractions and make way for real connection. Give it a try. Visit U.S. Cellular in store or online, and they'll help set up your phone to us mode free. Even if you're not a customer, built for superior 5G connection and real human connection. U.S. Cellular, built for us. Find out more at uscellular.com slash find us. Joe, Joe, a singular verse is better and more succinctly termed universe. Una being singular. <laughs> oh, hold on. I'm going to now change it from a singular verse <laughs> to a universe. Hold on a second. Hey, Dougie, Dougie, Doug. You know what? what? No, OGGG. I was thinking about our business the other day and thinking about how we have people all over the United States, both for Stacking Benjamins and for the planning business. And I'm always looking for easier ways to onboard people, easier ways to manage remote employees. JustWorks makes it easier for you to start, run, and grow a business. And let me tell you how JustWorks can help your business like it helps ours. The biggest thing that I'm thinking about is remote, hybrid, and all of that kind of stuff that's going on these days. We had the big argument a couple of weeks ago, Doug, about who gets more done? Who's better? It wasn't an argument. Uh, it was an argument. Yeah, I think it was. I'm not thinking that uh, you were right, but you thought you were right. And that's the most I important know thing. I'm right. The we're, whole basement agreed with me, but go uh, on. Yeah, the most, you know, most of the basement agreed with you, which is okay. Remote, hybrid, in person, and so on, with all the different ways of working these days, you need HR tools that can keep up. No matter where your team is or what shape it takes, Just Works helps you comply with state payroll tax requirements, labor laws, and access a variety of health insurance plans in any state. Let me tell you something. We have employees in, I think, 13 states, and it is a gigantic PIA. I'm not going to try to explain what that is. Gigantic PIA to be an expert in all these state requirements. Just have somebody else do it for you. JustWorks helps provide proactive support for all those federal, state, and local employment-related compliance needs. JustWorks makes it simple to hire and manage remote employees across all 50 states. I mentioned we have them in 13 so far. Cloud-based platform that enables managers' employees to quickly and secure access benefits and payroll and all the other HR-related stuff. 24-7 expert support if you need it. It's a self-service user interface. Super easy for your entire team to manage. Access to HR, certified HR consultants who can help you around best practices and transparent pricing. No hidden costs, so you know exactly what you're paying for. Learn more about JustWorks and how they can help you get more done by visiting JustWorks.com slash podcast. That's JustWorks.com slash podcast. All right. Now that we've got that English language stuff. Crack a dictionary. <laughs> it's chaos here today. We're going to start off talking social security like all the crazy podcasts talk about. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Our headline today comes to us from Go Banking Rates. Social Security cuts six things to know for financial planning 2024. This is written by Andrew Lisa. Andrew says in 2024, America's 67 million Social Security recipients will technically get a raise, but the boost to their benefits will be so marginal that the gain will feel more like a loss. Legislation from 1973 provides for annual cost of living adjustments designed to preserve the purchasing power of Social Security benefits as inflation drives up prices over time. Faster prices rise, the more the SSA increases the yearly cost of living. However, agency's method for calculating the adjustments is advocates worried that the coming year's increase leave many recipients struggling to do more with less. Well, the number came out on Monday of this week. Oh, gee, obviously, we need to record this a little bit ahead, but everybody expects, based on the way that they calculate this, as Andrew writes here, that we're going to see a cost of living increase that's much tighter than actually what uh, inflation has been for the average person. So people on Social Security should be should be gearing up for maybe a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a tightening of the belt this year. Yeah, I mean, there was a couple of years of some pretty good increases, and then 
for people who have been on social security for a long time, many years of no increases or very, very, very little increases over the years. So uh, when we record this, we don't know what the number is going to be, but it's calculated to be somewhere in the three, three and a half percent range, which is historically high for social security, but recently low. And then if you pay attention to the inflation data, while it's coming down, you know, inflation in August was still four and a half percent. So little less than what we're seeing in the inflation numbers, but still better than the historical average, if you will. The big thing that Andrew's getting to here is not really about this year, but for people planning on Social Security in the future, the way that this is all calculated is using something called the Consumer Price Index for Urban Wage Earners and Clerical Workers, CPI-W, to determine their cost of living. But if you go back, OG, to 2000, Andrew writes, the result is that every $100 in benefits you got in 2000, that's buying you just $64 worth of goods and services today. So we've seen a cut of roughly a third off the top in what your benefit has been, which means that if you're doing your financial planning, looking at being retired for a long time, you shouldn't think of Social Security then as keeping pace. You should think about it as maybe a declining benefit over time. I think you were talking about this last week a little bit about how Social Security benefits, really that cost of living increase, not not what people hope it would be. Well, it's never going to be exactly what you know, you're know you personally experiencing. I mean, for some people in different communities, that could be enough. It could be a, a, a decent increase. But if you're in a high cost of living area or if you're in an area that's having lots of growth and there's you know lots of price pressure because of supply demand issues, there's going to be some micro economies where you happen to be. And, and, you know, this is a national thing, right? So they just look across the board and say, hey, folks in Montana get the same price increase as the or cost of living increase as the folks in Phoenix and the same as the folks in L.A. and the folks in Detroit. So it's uh, a broad brush stroke, which I think is also really important as you're thinking about your planning. You know, if you're in your 40s and 50s and you're thinking about Social Security and saying, well, I'll, I'll have some of that. You can run those projections. You can go to SSA.gov. And it'll show you, here's how much you're going to get at 67. Here's how much you're going to get at 70. And you can put that in your plan. But I think you want to use a much lower inflation rate for those assets than you would your regular investment assets, which, again, as you back into that, means that you have to be more aggressive. You have to get a higher rate of return with your other equity investments because you have to keep up with inflation kind of doubly so, right? You've got this right. bucket of money that's not doing it, so you got to like bolster that bucket. And then you also have to do it on your own. This is another reason why we have some issues with uh, target date funds, which are generally getting more conservative before you need the money. Yeah. And I think what you're saying, OG, is that you can't afford to be getting conservative too soon. Yeah. I mean, I've often talked about the fact that I don't think that you should be conservative ever, because if you're if your money is invested correctly, then it should always be kind of, produ you know, you should always be thinking that uh, that you have a bucket for that 30 year money. Right. And you have some of it that's needed tomorrow, for sure, if you're closing in on retirement. But you should also be thinking, well, I need money when I'm 90 years old, too. Again, back to your example, folks that retired in 2000, if they retired at 65 in 2000, yeah, they're 88, 89 today. That's a pretty healthy retirement time frame, but there's lots of 89-year-olds and there's an increasing amount of 89-year-olds every single year as health gets better and thinking about like benefits and longevity and you know taking better care of ourselves and all that sort of stuff there's going to be more and more older people so that's going to be you someday and so it's not uncommon to have this 20 30 year time horizon the folks who retired in 2000 if all they said was oh, I'm going to be nice and conservative right now to your point about cost of living, it's been cut by a third in terms of their fixed income. So it's a really big deal. You don't see inflation year to year, much like we did the last year. Last year was obviously an anomaly. We, you know, over the last two years, give or take, the normal 3% inflation is like death by a thousand paper cuts. You know, you just don't really experience it until you look at it in a big picture. Next Monday, we're going to do a full episode, one of our top five episodes, and this will be an episode that I'm sure we're going to be referring back to a lot, our top five ways to cut expenses. But I think a couple things to do, OG, well, number one, make as many expenses the same as possible so that it's easier to live on this fixed income that you have. So if you're one of, by the way, they, they talk about the number of people here that are living on Social Security 
12 percent of men 15 percent of women count on it for at least 90 percent of their income those people have some tough choices to make andrew writes 37 percent of men 42 percent of women rely on it for more than 50 percent of their income so you're going to be looking at cutting expenses for 2024 but making sure your grocery budget's the same every week getting those utilities on a plan where it's the same those by the way don't save you money over the long term but it makes it easy for you to get a predictable budget yeah so that when things go wrong you can lock down the rest of it yep yep i'm not going to give away my answers because uh you already stole two of mine yeah the, the, those will be we're gonna, we're gonna have our tough yeah, as he's writing furiously what i just said so right joe now. said <laughs> yes joe could you say three more so i can maybe say that you stole those too that's that's coming up next week but let's pivot to this idea which is i remember giving talks back when i was a financial planner about social security and the one of the number one questions i get from people who weren't yet retired is how do i treat social security my financial plan do i do i look at it like some of these people relying on it for 90 percent, or do we not include it at all where do you come down on putting social security benefits in your financial projections for the future? I mean, I, I honestly think that it's going to be around even for people that are, let's say 40 and under, you know, will there be changes associated with social security? A hundred percent. There has to be. I've yet to see a government program that goes away. It just seems to, they, they seem to evolve over the years. So I'm not concerned about the money not being there, but I would expect there to be some changes in terms of timing, so on and so forth. That years ago, there was a study done by the IMF about the solvency of Social Security. And one of the suggestions was if they took everybody who is under 40 and said there is no option to get Social Security until age 70. So there's none of this like reduced benefit stuff. Like right now, you can take Social Security at 62 or 63 or 65 or, you know, anytime up to 70. If you just said everybody under 40, you only get it at 70 or later, period, end of discussion it would virtually solve the social security mess because, you know, it takes away all of that time, you know, that early retirement time. The downside, of course, is that, you know, from a political standpoint, it's very, very, very difficult to bring up and talk about, but eventually we'll have to do that. So I think if you're planning on it for retirement, what you are planning on a part of your retirement, what you might want to do is look at that full retirement benefit, move it forward three years to age 70. And then as you add inflation to it, add inflation at a lower rate than you're projecting in your plan. So if you're saying, I think my normal expenses are going to increase at 3% a year, put Social Security increasing at 1.5% a year. Be conservative with that stream of income increasing so that you can see the gap that emerges like we were talking about you know, in your 80s and early 90s when, when the power of that compounding has had an opportunity to affect. Yeah. We're going to dive more into this in our newsletter, The 201, uh, which comes out every Tuesday, Thursday. That is free for everybody who listens to the show. StackyBenjamins.com slash 201 if you'd like to talk more about not just this topic, but our next topic, which is Lee Huffman coming down to the basement. Lee is an expert in travel. He has been to a ton of places, but he also does something really unique, guys. He talks to people who are from different places on earth. You know how you say uh, I like traveling to X, but I always find I just see with the tourists see. Well, he gets behind the scenes with local people and with some of the top travel names. So the host of We Travel There going to help you get more out of your heart and benjamins when it comes to travel. But before that, travel and you're wearing jeans. I think uh, I think you've got some blue jean related trivia, Doug. You're darn tootin' I do, Joe. Hey, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. You know, speaking of travel, I've been a proud fanny pack user for years. The pockets in my jeans are just too dank small. I constantly lose things no matter which brands I try. I mean, like Free People, Ann Klein, Lulu's. Over 540 million pairs of jeans are sold in the U.S. every year, with the average American owning seven pairs each. <laughs> That's a lot of evening wear. The first ever pair of blue jeans was patented by Levi Strauss and Company in 1873 and were marketed as work pants. In the 1950s, after a series of bad boy characters wore them in films like Rebel Without a Cause, they were banned in schools. School boards across the country worried that wearing them could lead to rebellious behavior like listening to financial podcasts. Ooh. Today's trivia question is, what celebrity said, you want to know what comes between me and my Calvins? nothing <laughs> i'll be back right after i find the pliers i use to zip up my jeans
Hurricane season's almost here, and the time to prepare is right now. When Hurricane Ida hit the Gulf Coast, it destroyed countless homes, left money without access to food and clean water. Over a million lost power, some for weeks. The floods that followed the hurricane washed out some roads, made it possible for many grocery stores to restock shelves. Some families were left hungry and desperate, waiting for help that was slow to arrive. But what if you didn't have to rely on anybody else to provide for your family during a crisis? The answer is simple. Be prepared with emergency food kits from 4Patriots. Their long-lasting and delicious food options are specifically designed to provide you and your loved ones with the sustenance you need when you need it most. 4Patriots survival food kits are hand-packed in the USA, last for up to 25 years, compact inside covert storage totes, include a wide variety of delicious breakfasts, lunch, and dinners, backed by thousands of five-star customer reviews. 4Patriots survival food, not just for natural disasters, because in today's worlds of uncertain supply chains, unpredictable emergencies. I remember here when, um, remember in Texas when the grid went out? And how wild that was. It's more important than ever to have a backup plan, whether it's a temporary power outage like that one, winter blizzard like that one, or rising food cost. You can rest easy knowing you have a reliable source of food to see you through. Right now, you can go to 4 and use code SB to get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store, including our emergency food supply kits designed to last up to 25 years. Just go to the number 4Patriots.com. Use code SB to get 10% off your first purchase of 4Patriots survival food. That's 4Patriots.com. Use code SB. Hey, I've got a fantastic podcast recommendations for when you're done with this episode of Stacking Benjamins. You know, often we listen to shows like Stacking Benjamins because we're so anxious, we're so worried about our money that we just need to know more. I agree. Knowing more about a topic is a great way to calm down and to relax about it. But often we look for these external ways to get less anxious when we truly got to look in, which is why I like Kitty Kremitzo's show, Meditation for Anxiety. They're guided meditations to help ease anxiety. You can feel more calm and peaceful in minutes. Super easy. You just press play and listen whenever worry or stress is too much. And if you're really feeling intense worry, well, it can certainly help during times of overwhelm. Uh, it helps me fall asleep. If my mind's anxious and keeping me awake. So do what I do. Subscribe to Meditation for Anxiety on your favorite podcast player. That's Meditation for Anxiety. And we'll have a link in our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Hey there, stackers. I'm bad boy and soon-to-be blue jeans model, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. During the break, I talked to some people here at the show, and apparently men's jeans are made with twice the pocket depth as women's, which of course means I've been wearing lady pants this whole time. No wonder they're so short on me. Looks like Joe's mom's going to be getting my hand-me-downs. Lucky her. Today's trivia question is, which celebrity said, you want to know what comes between me and my Calvins? Nothing. The answer, arguably the most famous denim commercial of the 20th century, the Calvin Klein campaign that featured that tagline starred actress and supermodel Brooke Shields. Although the exact figure is unknown, it's estimated that Shields earned between five hundred dollars and $800,000 for the commercial. Here, I would have done it for half that. And now, here to teach you how to travel better, it's the host of the We Travel There podcast, Lee Huffman. And I'm super happy he's back in the basement. I've actually got a notification that the first time he was here was nine years ago this week. My brother by another mother, because it looked men, it's Mr. Lee Huffman. How are you, dude? Hey, it's great to be here. You know, we both age like fine wines. We do. Uh, at least that's what I tell myself, and that's what I tell my wife, you know? And we just keep saying, it's like a mantra, you know, <laughs> just if I just keep saying it, maybe, maybe that'll help. Yeah, I think I can. I think I can. <laughs> Let's start off here, man. All these episodes you've done of We Travel There, where do most of us get it wrong when it comes to planning that next trip, that next vacation? Well, I think the main thing is either it's one of two things. Either you try to cram way too much into your trip or you don't plan ahead at all and you're just scrambling around, running around and not knowing exactly what you're doing. Like in my, in my show notes for my podcast, I put a little Google map of all the different places we talk about. So that way, when you're planning your trip, you can plan it. So that way you can hit all the things on one side of town 
one day and then everything on the other side of town another day, instead of going back and forth, back and forth, I used to do that so right. much and I would be so frustrated that I'd waste so much time commuting back and forth between attractions. It's so funny when I first started traveling with Cheryl, she would get angry because I was the over planner. I was the guy that would plan every minute. Like I had, I had the spreadsheet, you know, at four fifty-seven, we're going over oh, here. Yeah. Then at five fifteen, we'll be over here. And we'll, but she's like, we can't do that. We got to leave some, you, you know, I went to a Catholic school in our junior high dances. They'd always say, leave room for Jesus. You know, <laughs> Cheryl was always like, leave some room for spontaneity. No, absolutely. Well, on the other side, Lee, though, there's my parents, you know, we just went with them uh, to Northern Minnesota and my dad was like, I can't believe the stuff you guys plan. Like, how did you find this great restaurant? I'm like, I, I just went to TripAdvisor. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, I think it's one of those things, especially, I mean, for you, your kids are grown. You know, I still have young kids. My kids are eight and 12. I'm trying to get them more involved in the planning. So that way it's just not me doing all the things that I think they like, or it's things that I want to do. I'm trying to get them more involved because eventually they're going to leave the nest, right? And I want them to have those skills of knowing what they like and knowing what to do and, and being able to plan their own trips because, you know, yeah, again, they're going to leave the nest and I don't want them going out there and, and being those people that uh, I'm here in Paris. I'm not sure what to do, but I hear it's really cool. What are your favorite tools? If you're going, well, let's take Paris. Cause you just sure. said Paris. If you're, if somebody, one of our stackers headed to Paris for the first time, what are your favorite tools to begin fleshing out that uh, perfect trip? Well, I think one of the things that, a lot of people overlook just because it's like old school is actually looking at like the, the visitors bureaus, uh, their website or actually their, the office when you actually, when you land, they can like one, they have just a, a tremendous amount of resources on their sites. A lot of times they'll have itineraries for different types of interests, whether it's like you're a foodie or you like architecture or museums or whatever it is that you like, they have different itineraries for you and different ideas, uh, that way. Or you can actually just go into the office and say, Hey, I'm really interested in, in X, Y, and Z give me some ideas of things I can do like in that part of town, or I'm only here for like three days, those type of things. And and you don't have to wait till you actually arrive at the destination. A lot of times you can submit a form on their website or reach out to them on social media and they're happy to, to uh, respond to you. I get afraid of visitors bureaus because I, I see visitors bureaus as you cross the Florida state line on I-75 <laughs> all the way to, to Orlando. And you and I both know those are just, you know, timeshare people. Oh yeah. yeah just, yeah. just, trying hard to to get there. But to your point, we went to the Hill Country in Texas uh, last year to Bandera and there was a visitor's bureau on the corner and Cheryl goes, let's go in. I'm like, I don't want to go into visit. What are you talking about? You know, what's cool. The guy gave us VIP tickets to the rodeo, which he's like, Hey, take my tickets. Now you, I'm not telling our stackers you're going to get VIP tickets to the rodeo. He just, we were having a great conversation. He goes, Hey, the rodeo's tonight. I get VIP tickets. Do you guys want mine? I'd never been to a rodeo. It was one of the most fun things ever. We had such a blast and I'm in this little gray area, but, but to your point, he knew the hikes to do in the area. We told me like hiking. He knew some of the stuff to avoid, which was cool. He even told us a couple of restaurants not to go to, which was which was awesome. When I interview a lot of people for the podcast, I actually try to avoid interviewing anybody specifically from the visitors bureau because a lot of times they have to be politically correct and represent everybody. Kind of like mm. I don't have a favorite child. All of them. I love them all equally. And right. so it's hard for them to have Except that third kid of mine's a little <laughs> jerk, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like they, they're afraid to like steer you away from someplace or really steer you to someplace because they're afraid of somebody else getting upset. But uh, but one thing I really love, and obviously we love saving money, is a lot of times they'll have discounts. Maybe they'll have like a an attraction pass where you can pay a flat fee and get free admission to uh, a number of different restaurants or uh, museums or attractions and those types of things. So it's a great way to find some great things to do, but also to be able to save some money on your on your trip. Going back to Paris, I talked to many people who've gone to Paris a lot of Americans can't stand Paris because they say they don't like Parisians. And by the way, if you're here from Paris, you guys already know this, <laughs> the, the way people talk about Paris. But you know what? My analogy is, Lee, when and, and I thought Cheryl did this really well. She had to spend several days in Paris and we went to the different ports. She, she cut it into four sections. Oh, sure. And we spent a different part of the trip in a different section of town getting to know it. And what's funny was when we were in the super touristy areas, St. Germain, to put it in the most American way, it's probably Saint Germain or some, I, I can't do the French thing. <laughs> but when we were there, people were the same way they are in Manhattan, the super touristy areas of Manhattan. They were just mean in a different language. And then I realized part of the reason that Americans often, I think, 
feel like they don't like Paris is because they, they're in the super touristy areas. Sure. My, my question is, on one hand, I want to see Notre Dame. But on the, was that better than, say, Notre Dame? Yeah. Th- they want to see the, the, the big attractions, but they also want to do, you know, they hear people like you saying, well, get in with the locals. You know, mm-hmm. we had Joseph Rosendo on. He said, it's not about the place. It's about the people. Sure. How do I see the good stuff, but still also make sure I get some of that local flavor? Well, first off, when I, the first time I went to, to Paris, everybody was super nice, very welcoming, very friendly, very helpful. You know, uh, we spoke just a little bit of French. So I think n- number one, knowing a little bit of the local language, even if it's just a, f- a couple phrases, a few words, that goes a long way. I think that's one of the big problems with when Americans travel is they just assume everybody speaks English. A lot of them do, but you at least have to try to speak their language. And just that little effort, even if you butcher the language and like you sound <laughs> like you have marbles in your mouth, right? As long as you're trying it goes a long way for them and they are super happy. And then they will switch because they realize your French is horrible. I'm going to switch over to English because neither one of us can understand what you're saying. You know, so going out of your way to know a little bit is, is great. The first time I went to Paris, everybody was helpful. The one bad experience I had, because you know, we were there for like two weeks. I wanted a little bit of a uh, you know, slice of home. And I went to the McDonald's by the Louvre. And that was the one place that people were rude to me. I, I just wanted a plain hamburger, just meat and bun. And they told me, no, we can't do that. I'm like, just don't put things on it. They're like, no, sorry, we can't do that. And they were absolutely rude to me. And that was the only time that I ever had a bad experience in Paris. That's funny. I had the same thing in London, Hard Rock Cafe. I was very tired. I was collecting the glasses from Hard Rock Cafe. So I went to Hard Rock Cafe and they were horrible. But to your point, it's some of the very touristy things where you get in trouble had that in Indonesia, by the way, just knowing how to say thank you in Indonesian. I learned very few words, but they would laugh, but, but they would be <laughs> so excited when I'd speak a little Indonesian. It yeah. was, it was super fun. I mean, it just, it shows that you care enough about the locals, about the culture to learn a little bit. I mean, how long is it going to take you to learn please and thank you, you know, in another language, five minutes, 10 minutes, just showing that little bit of effort yeah. goes a long way. How much do you rely on sites like TripAdvisor? Uh, I don't go on them too much. Uh, you know, I, I do use things like Yelp and, and things like that. Uh, Google obviously has a lot of reviews on their site now as well. Same thing with Facebook. You can look either on like on social media, they put a hashtag for the city and you'll find some of the different suggestions that way. Uh, or you'll find like expat groups or different groups of people that travel to different cities and uh, reach out to them and say, Hey, I'm planning to go to the city. Any recommendations? People love to share their recommendations. I will tell you this, you know, I mean, everybody wants to be like that travel guy that, that knows like the, the it spot. So literally just put it out on social media and you'll get a bunch of people telling you, Hey, try this restaurant, do this attraction, avoid this, you know, do this, stay in this part of town, those type of things. Or you can always listen to one of my podcast episodes. (laughs) (laughs) That might might help too. Nice plug. (laughs) <laughs> I do like that though, because you know, when you asked me when I was on your show a long time ago, we, uh, we talked about Northwest Arkansas mm-hmm. and I was like super geeked about this gem of an area that a lot of people don't know. It's just so absolutely beautiful. Yeah. You threw me for a curveball there <laughs> with, with Bentonville. <laughs> I love that throwing a lot of people for a curveball. And you know, it's funny. I've learned since then, everybody who goes there goes, Hey, if you love it, don't tell anybody. Because oh, yeah. it's so absolutely beautiful. They did, they don't want that. Is there a difference though? You know, we just transitioned from Paris to Bentonville, Arkansas. <laughs> so a little, they're, little they're very similar. They're very similar. A little bit of a change there, maybe. Well, they do have the Louvre of American art, right? They do, oh, they totally do. Oh, yeah, they see? totally do. Good, see? nice. Yes. There's a similarity. Yeah. You you have to, have to, if you're listening to this, you have to go to Crystal Bridges Museum. And people go, What? Bentonville? Yes, you have to go. Let's dive into, though, American travel, a difference when you're traveling domestically versus traveling internationally. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Uh, One, I think, one, most Americans don't even have a passport. Maybe like 50% do. And of those people that actually do have a passport, they don't really use it, you know. And so obviously the vast majority of Americans are only going to travel regionally or, you know, within the United States. And so the ways to improve your travel there, one find an airline or a hotel that you really love and stick with it. Accumulate those miles and points as, as quickly as possible by getting the card, uh, by using their shopping portal, sign up for their dining rewards program, all these different things to accumulate as many miles and points as quickly as possible. That way you can book some free travel and save those uh, Benjamins for other goals that you have. You know, But when you're traveling within the US, 
even though the lines are getting a little bit longer now, I highly recommend signing up for a TSA pre-check. You don't have to take out your, your liquids. You don't have to take off your shoes. You can keep your belt on, you know, all those different types of things. Uh, you know, when you go through those dedicated lines at the airports, again, the lines are getting a little bit longer, but you can go through the so much easier through airport security when you're going through in uh, domestic airports. And uh, it, it's a huge time saver. If you've ever been one of those people that you're rushing to catch the plane, you'll be very thankful that you save those you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Let's talk. I want to get back to that because I want to tackle the first part that you said first, which are these point programs out there. Obviously, you only want to do these if you're paying the credit card off in full. Mm -hmm. But my question is, is this, I was at a Camp Fi recently and they were talking about how, you know, I use the Marriott point program because I, I just like staying at Marriott hotels. So I decided yeah. that was it. I found out at a Camp Fi, that is not a great point program. Yeah. We, we call it Bon Void. You got bon void whenever they <laughs> whenever there's a bad problem. So it's turned into a verb. Why is that? It's so hard to accumulate points. No, they just ever since they uh, acquired uh, Starwood, uh, you had some very loyal people to Starwood that were used to high service levels. Marriott hasn't always lived up to those expectations, and then you know they've done a lot of different changes to their credit cards and to the rewards program. That you know, and then obviously you know some of the service issues when you're staying at a property. So they just turned it into the a verb. You bon void turned into bon void. <laughs> I got bon void. <laughs> I was told by those people, Hyatt, the Hyatt program right now is is where it's at in terms of point value. Would you agree with that? Hyatt has one of the best values as far as points. They have some of the best elite status benefits. Like Hilton and Marriott have been actually devaluing their their upper levels of elite status, whereas uh, Hyatt still has some of the best benefits as far as free breakfast either in the lounge or at their on-site restaurant. And they just, they waive parking fees for valet and, and those type of things when you're redeeming points. So it's one of the best programs. The problem though is they don't have locations in, in every place mm -hmm. you want to go. Yeah. And so like Hilton and Marriott and IHG, they have a far superior like map of locations. So uh, whereas if you want to use Hyatt, like you may or may not have a property there. Or if they do, you probably, you maybe only have like a, like a Hyatt Express or, you know, one of like the lower level properties, like a Hyatt place. Back in the day, Airbnb in it or VRBO seems so fun. Yeah. Lately, it seems the shine has come off of some of those properties. You still like getting the local flavor with an Airbnb or VRBO? I've only actually stayed at one Airbnb property ever. And it was for a soccer tournament for my kids over in like Eastern Tennessee and Gatlinburg. We had a great time, great experience. The owner was very re receptive and responsive to you know, small minor tweaks. The big problem I have is if you are staying for a short period of time, the cleaning fees. Oh my God, they kill you. Yeah, they overwhelm the per daily rates. And so they really only make sense if you're in like a really big unit and with a bunch of people, or you're going to be staying there a little bit longer period of time. Uh, what I don't like is that not only are you paying to stay, you're paying a cleaning fee, but then they actually give you this laundry list of, okay, put the dishes in the dishwasher, <laughs> take the trash out, take the sheets off the bed. Yeah, you know, all the stuff. I'm like, why am I paying you a cleaning fee if I'm doing all the cleaning? I should where's where's my portion of that money? Well, part of that what's sad is what's sad is it used to be, you know, like a couch surfing thing and it was fun between a certain type of traveler, and now it's just become a hotel surrogate. And oh sure. And yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll say this, like when you talk about Marriott and everything, when you're picking a hotel loyalty program, think about where you like to travel. And look at the locations of what properties they have there. And maybe you're okay with a lower level property because maybe you're not going to spend that much time in the property, but maybe you're taking your wife for a like a, an anniversary trip or like a special birthday or something like that. You don't want to stay in the Holiday Inn Express, right? Like she's not going to be impressed. You want to be at a Park Hyatt, a Ritz. Dude, free breakfast. You know? <laughs> free breakfast. Well, Come I mean, the, those waffles are pretty good. I will say Think of the the type of experience that you want in the on the vacation you're taking, and maybe again, maybe you don't care. You just, all you need is a bed and a clean place to put your stuff, and then you're happy. And then yeah, go ahead, go for like those budget level uh, properties. But if you're going there for a special occasion, those type of things, you want something you know higher end. We went to um, St. Kitts a few years ago. They have a Hyatt and they have a Marriott. Both of them are you know on the higher end. The, the Hyatt was a higher end property. The Marriott was like upper middle class level. But there were no Hiltons, right? And so if you want to go there and you're you're dead set to go to St. Kitts, sorry, if, even if you had millions of Hilton points, you're not going to be able to stay there, right? And so I always tell people, like, plan the next vacation that you're going to do and figure out what airlines fly there and what hotels are there. 
and make sure that the level of, of experience that you want matches what the availability is. And then, then from there, focus on getting your credit card points. Uh, you mentioned earlier that like, yeah, obviously you pay off your bill, but there are other ways to be able to earn miles and points and rewards on daily activities where you don't even need a new credit card. Most of us shop online. Instead of going directly to like Staples or Target or Kohl's or Home Depot or whatever, instead of going there first, go through like a shopping portal like Cashback Monitor or directly to like American Airlines or Southwest or you know Hilton. They have these shopping portals. You can go there. So not only are you going to get rewards on your card, even if it's a debit card, you can still participate in this. You're going to get rewards directly from the website. It's basically kind of like sharing the affiliate marketing revenue that they're going to earn off of your purchase. Oh, you're getting both. Yeah. You're stacking rewards. Absolutely. You got double rewards there. Whenever you travel and you're looking at different places to eat, you know, it's a new city. You don't really have any ideas of where you're going to eat anyways. Go to their dining rewards program or uh, also sign up for this app called DOSH, D-O-S-H. They provide cashback rewards anywhere in range from like 5 to 10% cashback. Basically, sign up for both of those programs and link your cards and then go there and see which restaurants are participating in those programs. So now, basically, all the activities that you're doing on your vacation are earning miles and points and cash back towards your next vacation. On that note, I want to ask about airlines mm -hmm. because, you know, now that I'm back in Texarkana, I can fly any airline I want as long as it's American <laughs> Airlines. So, which stinks too, because also at Camp Fi, a thing that I learned was from the credit card hackers there is that is the worst points program, only because it's so rigid, right? It is very rigid. It's hard to move points in and out. But to your point, I have the dining part. I use the uh, shopping portal. Mm -hmm. I try to max the hell out of it because it is my airline. Yeah, yeah. I heard though from a lot of people, Southwest is still that companion pass, Lee, still the number one game in town. Do, do you agree with that? Yeah, I've had the Southwest companion pass every year since 2007. Can you tell people that don't know what the hell we're talking about what that Southwest companion pass is? Actually, there are several airlines that offer a companion pass or a companion certificate. And so basically what that allows you to do- American's one of them. Yeah, American yeah. has it on certain credit cards. Delta has it as well. And so basically when you have their credit card and you meet certain like thresholds, sometimes based on spending- uh, you get a companion certificate where you can buy a ticket and you get a designated companion that can fly with you for free. It's a great deal. And depending upon what type of flight you're taking, you can save hundreds of dollars on that. But Southwest does it one step better. Actually, a couple steps better. One, you can fly unlimited times throughout the year. And so my wife is my companion right now. We're going to go to Cancun later right, on this right year. Now. I like the right now. Well, it's right now because sometimes she, you know, she has like a normal job. You know, <laughs> I, I'm this like slacker, you know, freelance writer that works from home uh, and I get to travel. Whereas like she has like a normal nine to five. Right. And so I get, you got to specify the companion. Yes. So, is, is, is so basically with, oh. with Southwest, you pick your companion and you can actually change it three times per year. And so what I do is I book a flight, like say she and I, we're going to go to Cancun. And then once that's done, my son and I are probably going to go on a, on a ski trip. So then I'll switch. And now he's my companion. And then, oh. and then I can book tickets for him to go with me. And so that way, whenever you go on these flights, whether it's if it's domestic, you basically pay $5.60, like the, the FAA taxes. But if you pay, if you fly internationally, there's you know, sometimes a little bit more taxes. But basically you can use it a limited amount of times, whether you're using cash or credits or points to book your flight, your companion can fly free with you. And so it has saved us thousands upon thousands of dollars every year for the last like, you know, 15, 16 years. And it is by far the best airline benefit out there because if you're like me, like you want to save money and you want to be able to go on as many travel destinations as you can go, that's the way to go because you're saving all this money on, on tickets. First, I'm glad you weren't announcing some marital disharmony. I thought, <laughs> no, she, was, no, no. I thought she was dumping you. No, <laughs> <laughs> not yet. I kind of get to that edge sometimes with her where I, I annoy her a lot, but <laughs> thankfully she's very forgiving. She's close to let you, <laughs> you go. The second piece though, is that I'm hearing also, which, which we've said before, but I want people to hear this, you know, don't be afraid if you travel a lot then for these cards that maybe cost you a few dollars, right? There's yeah. some annual fees with these cards, but between, between TSA pre-check, which they'll often pay for the companion certificate, mm -hmm. maybe the lounge access, those yeah. can give you a lot of money. Absolutely. Like we, uh, we were just in Cabo for fall break and we hit the airport lounge there. We got free drinks and food for like three hours before our flight. And uh, we got our money's worth. I'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> Traveling with Lee be a good time. 
Yeah. The last thing I wanted to talk about was you talked about TSA pre-check. Mm -hmm. The thing Cheryl and I have had a discussion about, it isn't easy for me to get the global entry, which is the international version of being able to go through customs in the U.S. quickly. It just, it's a pain in the butt. I got to drive all the way to Dallas. I got to set up a meeting. I got all this stuff oh, I yeah. got to do. Sure. To get the global well, entry. Well, the, the good thing is they actually have something called global entry upon arrival, like interview on arrival. So you can actually go, once you're approved, go on your trip. And on the way back, as you're going through customs, they can actually finish your interview right there. We did that for my son coming back from Cabo a few years ago. Oh, that's what I'm going to have to do. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. Well, the cool thing is my credit card pays for it, right? Yeah. Uh, so my credit card pays for that ahead of time. I haven't seen it though. I haven't yet. And I've traveled internationally a few times, Lee. I haven't really found the benefit because if customs, maybe I've been lucky, customs have been fairly quick, Sure. but when I'm, I still get there early enough that I got to collect my bags and re-put them, you know, in for my domestic travel afterwards. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm still hanging around waiting for my bag. So I'm like, even if I save well, this time. And that's it, that, see, Joe, 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 don't be team check bag, be team carry on. You don't have to worry about waiting for your bag. Ah, see team carry on. We bring our bags. We're through security, we're through customs, and we're on our way. People like you that check your bags, I appreciate that because now there's more overhead bin space for me, but you got to wait for everybody. Ain't nobody got time for that, Joe. So, right, so maybe that's not my last question. <laughs> my global entry is like on the verge of expiring. I applied for my renewal. I've been waiting for like 10 months. I still haven't got my final approval. Maybe they're like, they realize I'm a spy or something. I don't yeah, know. They're on to you. They are. And, uh, but yeah, no, it's been like pending for like 10 months. I, I literally have a reminder in my to do list to check my global entry status every like two weeks just to see what's going on. And it's been pending for a long, long time. So but like they're backed up, like, right. You know, you talked about passports earlier. It takes right now through standard processing. It was taking like 10 to 13 weeks. They actually just upgraded it to eight to 11. So they are going through the backlog. And so eventually they're, they're going to catch up. But even though we've kind of gotten past a lot of the COVID stuff, yeah. it's still kind of an issue with uh, them processing that backlog. Boy, it's good. I did notice, by the way, I had to get my passport redone. I paid for expediting. That that came like clockwork. Mm -hmm. It came exactly in the amount of time that they talked yeah. about it. So glad that's not yeah. a problem. At least, have you heard of that being a problem for anybody else? No, like uh, we just renewed my son's passport in May. And yeah, we, we paid for expedited too because we were like we're kind of unsure of everything. And it's like 60 bucks extra to pay for expedited. Yeah. And you can pay like another $13 if you want to like ship like two day mail. It was worth it. It was like 75 bucks basically round number. And we got it in like four weeks. Yeah. It was totally worth it to pay that because when you're planning your trip, you want to be able to check off all these different things on your list and get past it and just move on to the next thing and focus on the next thing that needs to get done. Just kind of having that hanging over your head. Oh, when's my passport going to hear it? Is it going to get here in time for the trip? You don't want to deal with that. Like just pay for that convenience if you can afford it. Otherwise, if you can't afford it, like make sure you're planning far in advance and handling those things. So that way you don't have to worry about having that extra headaches. I did a better job of packing light this time going halfway around the world, Lee, but still there's got to be a guy like you traveling all the time. You want your best piece of packing advice? I always pack things folded on my way out and then I roll them really tight on the way back. That way I can fit souvenirs. That's a number one. Cause you know what we did? We went folded on the way out and uh, bought a duffel bag <laughs> to bring more stuff <laughs> back home. That is good. <laughs> and then you, you probably had to pay for a check bag, you know, 35 bucks, 55 bucks or whatever. For, no, well, uh, luckily, you know. luckily we had more because we checked the two main bags. Then I was able to carry the duffel bag in my computer bag. Yeah, oh, okay, so okay. Good. Nice, nice. Was this one of the trips we've heard about recently on the episodes like Bavaria or Thailand or wherever <laughs> yes. you went recently? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bali. Did I tell you I went to Bali? Right. Uh, we'll get off that before everybody rolls their eyes too much. Doug's going to be uh, throttling me here in a second. <laughs> If only there were a podcast, Lee, where people could hear more travel tips. If only they could hear about cool locations somewhere. Wouldn't it be great if somebody had a podcast about that? Yeah. You know, I'll have to talk to somebody about that. Yeah. I'm the host of the We Travel There podcast. Uh, we have weekly episodes coming out every Monday. And the great Steve Stewart is our editor as well. So the sound quality is really nice. But basically, we interview local experts from all over the world to find out about the best things to do in their city. Uh, they're about 30 minutes or so. If I go too long, then Steve slaps my hand. <laughs> and then every 10th episode, we actually do a special topic. Occasionally, you hear my kids or my wife on the episode. Uh, we've done topics on you know, how to start travel hacking, how to save money on flights. Uh, this week coming up, 
Uh, we actually have one about accessible travel. So I, I interview somebody who's in a wheelchair talking about how he travels and the pros and cons of what he experiences uh, while flying and, and venturing out to all these different destinations around the world. He actually has more passport stamps than I do. And so oh, wow. I'm really inspired by him and, and he does a great job. But it's really interesting learning about all these great cities. My to-do list and my bucket list keeps growing because we don't just focus on like the big cities. We also focus on- French like, Lick, Indiana. Yeah, smaller cities, Bentonville, Arkansas. You actually just mentioned Valley. Like uh, I did one just a couple of weeks ago called uh, Chengu Valley. And so big cities, small cities, because what, what I look to do is obviously you want to cover the big cities because you want to provide tips for, for those cities when people can have a better experience there. But also there's so many smaller cities that have a lot of great character, you know, great attractions of, you know, amazing people. And, you know, they deserve some love too, you know, and maybe you're not going to travel all the way to that one small city, but if you're in the area, you'll say, Hey, you know what? I heard about this really cool city. It's only like an hour away. Let's go check it out. You know, for example, like Kamakura, Japan, it's one hour south of Tokyo. You're not going to fly all the way to, to Japan just for Kamakura. But while you're in the area, you're like, hey, let's go check it out. Maybe carve out a day and, and go experience everything that there is to do there. And, and like we talked about earlier, you're getting away from some of those overly touristy areas and able to kind of experience life a little bit more like a local. I love that. We drive every year from uh, Texarkana to Detroit for the holidays. And a couple of years ago, finally decided to stop in and see Franklin, Tennessee. And, and you live right in that area. And I was mm-hmm. like, holy cow, this is the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> Absolutely. They have, a, they have a really great Christmas event with like, you know, the caroling and everything like that. And it's cute. They got like Frothy Monkey, like the, the coffee spot. And there's a lot of good spots down there. Well, next time we got to get together when I head that way. That's great. Absolutely. Lee, thank you so much for hanging out with us and giving our stackers some great travel tips. I super appreciate it. I really appreciate it. And we'll look forward to seeing you when we travel there. Hey, this is Lou Mangello from WDW Radio, and now when I'm not at Walt Disney World or sharing my passion for Disney World or eating, I am stacking Benjamins. Hey, uh, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline, guys, and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency OG, they put what you value first. We are getting very close to the day where I get to eat all those little Kit Kats. They're like about this big. <laughs> All these little kids show up at my house and they take one and I take one and they take one and I take one. It's like this really symbiotic Equitable. dance that happens at the end of every October. So we're starting to stock up. The good news is, is I know you've got some uh, delivery vehicles that you send out into the neighborhood to bring back even more Kit Kats. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes. Three little little monsters. Actually, I think the boys are too old like, now. So, what, he has, so just care. He has like cars that do this? took oh. me a minute to realize the sole purpose for OG's family having children. Yes. It's the sole reason Do OG the has kids. It's the Kit Kat. The sole reason. It's like the modern farming method. <laughs> exactly. He's like, hey, Mrs. OG, you know, it's, it's Kit Kat season. Kit Kat season. Harvest time is coming. That's right. And we don't have, any, time is we don't have any children. So I think, <laughs> I think we need to fix that, that issue. But it pays off. But sadly, they, like you said, OG, they grow out of it. That's that's the part that sucks. Yeah. So you know what? Maybe tell her you need to make some more. Not going to happen. <laughs> no. <laughs> it says here your loved ones in your time. You could have made some more loved ones, but I guess not. That's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. You go to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life now for a free quote. At Haven Life, their application, it's simple. It's online. You'll get an instant coverage decision used to take uh, OG and I, it felt like decades to fill out that long, onerous form for life insurance. Those days are over with Haven Life. You get on with it so that you can spend time uh, eating your Kit Kats. Please do the Kit Kat eating after you go to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life and get your life insurance all, all sorted out. Today, we're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline. Doug, who are we throwing out the Haven Lifeline to? Uh, We're throwing out the Haven Lifeline today to Stacker Patrick. Oh, Patrick. Hey, Patrick. What's up, man? Hi, Joe and OG. I have a question about 529 plans. My wife and I are hoping to have kids soon. Right now, I have about $6,000 in a 529 in my name that accumulated through various tax incentives within our state. My question is, do we open up new 529 plans for each of the kids when we have them, or do we keep contributing to my 529 and just make the kids the beneficiaries. I would like to keep control of that money in case they don't go to college, and then I can make the other children the beneficiaries. 
So are there any other advantages as far as uh, rolling it over to IRAs now that we can do that? Uh, is there anything I'm missing? Are there any advantages to opening up the kids' 529s or just keeping it in mind? I have a t-shirt already, and so I know Doug is licking his chops that he might get one. However, my wife and I are also <laughs> moving to Wisconsin next year, and I know Doug's thoughts on Wisconsin. So instead of having I love Wisconsin. him get my shirt, I think I would actually like his shirt. Thanks. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. You know what we're going to do for Patrick when he references your shirt? Of course, Doug has announced his candidacy for the 2024 presidential campaign. We're going to send him specifically that t-shirt. Uh, ah, I like it. Yes, that is I good. I like it. Spreading the good word. But, but he is talking smack about you with uh, your thoughts about Wisconsin. You're a big fan. I don't know why. I I, I spoke very glowingly of the cheese, of the folks from Wisconsin. <laughs> Lots of cheese. <laughs> and by the way, Patrick used uh, old-fashioned nomenclature when he talked about having children. We've now called that, uh, Patrick, it's having Kit Kat delivery vehicles. Kit Kat, yeah, or Kit Kat harvesters. Right. Yeah, either way. <laughs> Kit Kat harvesters. <laughs> that's, that's what Patrick's really up the to. The key is to find the idiots that leave the big bucket that says, please just take one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, OG, what what say you about uh, 529? Just put it in his existing 529 or open new ones? I mean, really, it's exclusive of any account fees that each 529 might have. It's really six of one, half dozen the other. The downside could be this, and he brought them all up. Number one, if you have money left over in a 529 for a child, then there's a new provision that allows you to transfer that into a Roth. There's a lot of bells and whistles that go with it and some hoops to jump through, and it's not available yet. It's supposed to be available next year, but I imagine they'll kick it another year because it's just a accounting nightmare. But you're giving up the the opportunity for that to be the case for your kids if there's extra like you, you know, think there or maybe there could be. Number two is that you can only change the beneficiary once per 12 month period. So if you end up having a couple of kick head harvesters that are uh, close to about the same age and you think about like, well, I might have a junior in college and a freshman in college at the same time, it's going to be very difficult to time out those distributions so that each child is getting some funds paid for because you can only change the beneficiary once per 12 months. So, you know, it ends up being a little bit uh, from a, from a logistical standpoint, a little bit of a, of an issue. It's not super clean to have one big family 529, if that makes sense. So I don't see any reason why you wouldn't want to have a plan for each kid. You can always change the beneficiary. You're always in charge of the money. It's not like a, uh, a gift to minors account type of account where if you open an UGMA account or an UTMA account, that money is legally the, the child's at age 18. A 529 is the property of the owner or contingent owner of the 529. Well, not property. That's the wrong way of saying that because it's a gift. But anyways, you're in control of it. So you don't have to worry about your kids, you know, going, sweet, dad saved a hundred grand and now I'm not going to college and I'm going to take the money. Like that's not a, that's not a thing that would happen. Plus you'll raise them better. You know, you'll just say, well, no Kit Kats for you. I was going to teach you the way. So I, I don't know. I think from simplicity, you can always have one, but there's some downsides to that. I'd probably just have one for each kid. It just seems cleaner that way in terms of like keeping your, keeping your mind straight of, you know, who's got what for college yeah. and, you know, am I on track for Bill and, you know, Billy's on track and Susan's behind, you know, just seems a lot easier versus one big bucket. That's what I would do. Have done. Yeah. I like that. I like that as well. I think there's another, there's another upside OG, which is that you, you know, he talked about state incentives and some states do have some, they're not that huge a deal though. I mean, you're not talking about big bucks by having 529s with one state versus another in most states around the country, but all the custodians aren't created equal. If you go to places like savingforcollege.com, you'll see that that some of the custodians out there are really bad. Some of the 529 plans out there are bad. And you don't know when one asset manager might change the game or a state might change the game. So the cool thing about my kids was rather than thinking of it as Autumn's pot of money and Nick's pot of money, while we had those set up the way that you talked about, having them have their own individuals, I was really more concerned with having two different asset managers. So I used Vanguard for one, and I used Fidelity for the other one. T. Rowe Price also has a good one. So we used the Nevada plan and the New Hampshire plan 
for our kids' college. Was that sort of a risk mitigation? It was. So if you pick the, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just having two different, and by the way, the chance of a 529 blowing up, not big. So that may be a little bit of overkill on my behalf, but um but I do like it. Did you take them out to dinner first to find out if they were good people, the managers? <laughs> like, how did you decide? Yeah. Maybe a movie? Well, if you look at, right, if you look at uh, savingforcollege.com, there's a lot of good uh, a lot of good stuff on all the different asset managers out there for every state. So you can look at your state. You'll look at the tax incentives there. You'll also see the experience of the different uh, companies that run the 529 plans that are uh, available in every state. So we can link to that in the show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. But OG, oh, I like it for that reason as well. Perfect. Sounds like we agree. Patrick, thanks so much uh, for the question. And uh, Patrick is going to score a different t-shirt for calling in apparently a second time. Head to stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail. If you would like to ask uh, OG and uh, Doug and I a question Hey, uh, time for the last segment of this podcast, which we call The Back Porch. This is where we dive into stuff going on in our personal lives, maybe sometimes some uh, movies. I know what everybody's asking about, though. They're wondering, we did the live from Bali episode on Monday. How was the trip, Joe? So I've prepared 186 million slides. (laughs) Everyone's thinking, where can we get more Bali content? (laughs) Please tell us more. Exactly it. Oh, I hope they talk about it in the back porch. So I sent you guys just a few pictures. We went to three different islands. People are considering going to Indonesia. The first part, we went to Java, which had a lot of antiquity. You guys can see, I sent you a picture of... Yeah, I see water. I see a picture of water. I see a picture of grass. We have those things here, Joe. And a picture of what looks like part seal, part coyote. Right. So let's talk about that last one with the grass, which is uh, Boro Burdur, which is a UNESCO heritage site. It's one of the oldest, if not the oldest... Buddhist uh, temple on earth. It was, it was just simply amazing. But when we were on Java, we saw not just that, but we saw other antiquity sites. It was like going back in history between different Buddhist and Hindu sites. And we went to Jakarta. We had a big long layover in Jakarta. This was interesting. People say, when you go to Indonesia, make sure that you use taxis as just one example of places where you could get ripped off, use taxis that have meters because the taxis without meters will try to take advantage of the fact that you're not from there. And man, so we, we immediately, because we got this long layover, we're going to go downtown, which is about an hour away from the airport. So we go out to the taxis and we got these taxi drivers all over us. And I said, do you have a meter? And, and the first guy that we talked to is like, oh yeah, oh yeah. And so we walked to his taxi and guess what? There isn't in his car. There is, there is no meter. And he goes, he goes, oh, I take you downtown. It'll cost. And by the way, if you want to feel wealthy, go to Indonesia because their local currency, the rupiah, a hundred thousand rupiah, a hundred thousand real money dollars, we'll call it. Guess how much that <laughs> nice. is in, in real <laughs> no, US Why does money? everybody hate Americans when they travel abroad? I can't figure it out. <laughs> Can't figure that out at all. Yeah, what does that equal in real money? That's six dollars and fifty cents. So there were there were some times when when our bill came to a million. I'm like, hey, uh, our bill's sixty two dollars, sixty four dollars, or sixty four dollars. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was it was it was pretty wild. But anyways, this guy said it's going to cost me five hundred and fifty thousand, which we know is just shortened to five fifty. We instead go to another taxi service that was recommended, and I'm being hounded by like eight different taxi drivers. I find a taxi service has a meter. It costs 120000 versus 550000 Just a total one, one fifth of the, of the cost. Later on, I saw this weasel. We went to this place. If you guys see the picture of the thing, it's called a Luwak. It's from the weasel family. This is Luwak Coffee. Do you know how these things are involved in the making of coffee, OG? I do, and I'm not interested, but I can tell you like it. <laughs> so the Luwak, for people that don't know, they find the best coffee beans, and they only eat the, the best ones. Like they are known for being very discriminating about what they eat. And uh, it goes right through it them. goes through their digestive system, goes right through them, and people go out and they collect it, and they make coffee from it. And so a lot of people call it weasel poop coffee. And I've had, 
I've had the opportunity to try this in the past and it's a delicacy. And sometimes in the United States, you could pay 50, 60, $70 for one cup of this coffee. And uh, because you're on site, self service, where the where the weasels where are, where the poop's dropping, <laughs> you can get it for significantly cheaper. So this time, I decided to have literally some delicious, it's delicious. Literally, did you hear what you just so, said? <laughs> I did. I did. I said that on purpose, Doug. I, I still got it. I've been gone for a couple of weeks, but I still got it. It was it was so good. Uh, I brought home some of the Luwak coffee. So if you guys want nope. to try it, pass. I'm good. Sure. <laughs> no, nope. I'll take the instant Folgers. Thank you. That's my travel encounter for anybody that wants the 187,000 pictures that I took. We can, we can have that. Maybe we'll do a special episode. OG for sure. Maybe, <laughs> uh, coming up on Friday, we've got Heidi Dusick who took her family on a year sabbatical. She's partway through that year sabbatical with her entire family. We're going to chat with her about her recent uh, trip to Alaska uh, with the family. How has the year off gone? She's on a roundtable episode on Friday, which will be a lot of fun. Also this week, no Instagram Live, which we normally have because our team's at FinCon. And uh, if you're going to be at FinCon. That's funny. I, I didn't hear the air quotes there, Joe, when you said our team is at FinCon. <laughs> huh. Once It'll again. Be... <laughs> It'll be, look at the wow. time. Uh, I'll be the keynote, the closing keynote speaker at FinCon. So make sure you're there Saturday afternoon as I close out the FinCon conference and probably never get invited back. You tried that once before and it didn't work. <laughs> so uh, come say hi to us in New Orleans this week. Uh, that's it. If you're not here to talk about New Orleans, you're not here to complain about the fact that you're not going to New Orleans. You're here because of the fact that what you're hoping is uh, to make better financial decisions. OG and his financial planning team are taking new clients. Stackybenjamins.com slash OG gets you to the link for his calendar so that you can have a meeting with them to see how his team can interface with you and your team to make better financial decisions. Stackybenjamins.com slash OG. All right, that puts a pin on this week. Doug, take us home, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from Lee Huffman. Traveling? Explore the unexpected and look for savings opportunities. You may be able to see more for less, and the money you do spend can probably be maximized to create lasting memories. Second, is your income fixed? Look to lock down as many expenses as possible, like your utility and grocery bills, and you'll be on your way to a better budget and more predictable financial outcomes. But the big lesson... If you give Joe's mom your low-rise pants, probably don't compliment her on her whale tail. Thanks to Lee Huffman for joining us today. You can find out more about his podcast, We Travel There with Lee Huffman, wherever you're listening to us right now. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lisa Curry, who's also the host of the Long Story Long podcast, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Wonder how beautiful we all are? Of course, you'll never know if you don't check out our YouTube version of this show, engineered by Tina Eichenberg. Then you'll see once and for all that I'm the best thing going for this podcast. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Youngkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. Say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. 
I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. We're all juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth. The Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help. I'm not here to tell you what to do, but I'm here to tell you what I would do, which is I ain't following for bankruptcy. Unless I owed a million dollars, something crazy, then I'm like, that makes sense. People be filing for bankruptcy for some old $10,000. No, there are other alternatives to file for bankruptcy that won't curtail your ability to make money. You want to know some of them? Here you go. There's credit counseling. Brown Ambition. Wherever you listen.